and welcome to the AIM Summit webinar on M&A in Emerging and Frontier Markets. I'm your moderator, Zachary Sefrati, the CEO and founder of Dalma Capital. We have over 30 countries participating in this session. Amongst you are institutional investors, family offices, uh, owners of some of the key businesses in the emerging markets, high net worth individuals, and leaders of the financial industry. Please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A dialogue you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please just submit them as they come. Anytime we'll be picking uh, from those questions and addressing them throughout the session. If you're joining us on YouTube, please like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel now. Go to aimsummit.com so you can be part of the live sessions and the Q&A. Introducing our webinar partner, Charles Russell Speechlees. Charles Russell Spe Speechlees is an international law firm headquartered in the UK with offices in the Middle East, Asia, and Europe. Their Middle East-based team advises on matters and transactions across all lines of business services, investments, corporate transactions, real estate development, litigation, and dispute resolution. Introducing our speakers today, we have Bill Reichert. Bill leads Charles Russell Speech in his Middle East corporate practice and has more than 20 years experience on matters ranging from seed series investments to startups to complex multi-billion dollar acquisitions across numerous jurisdictions. We also have with us Jad Elon. Uh, Jad Elon is a managing director responsible for Brookfield Asset Management's in activities in the Middle East including overseeing the Dubai office and was also intricately involved in several of the major transactions, the landmarks that Brookfield partnerships have done this year, including Miras and the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. Uh, Brookfield, as you may know, is an alternative asset manager globally with over $600 billion of assets uh, under management and uh, over a hundred year heritage. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us today. William, I wanted to open with a, a question about setting the context. Uh, what do investors typically look at that is different in emerging and frontier M&A markets as opposed to developed markets, particularly some of the risk factors that you see in emerging markets, uh, such as the reliability of legal system, protection of property rights, impartiality of courts, corruption. What are some of these issues that you see investors focusing on? Thanks, Zach. Um, well, I mean, I think that uh, in in many ways, um, you know, they're looking for the same thing they would look for in, in development markets, and, and that is they're looking for the return. Um, obviously, if your risk is higher, uh, as it's going to be for um, uh, often in emerging markets, you're going to look for a higher return. Um, and so what you really want to do is figure out ways to try to mitigate uh, that risk or or you'll have no return. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, you've already touched upon the fact that that there are a lot of risks related to legal issues. Um, for example, an unreliable legal system, uh, a failure to uphold the rule of law, poor, poor protection for property rights, uh, including intellectual property rights. Um, there can be political risks, regime stability. Um, and of course, probably the three biggest risks uh, corruption, corruption, and corruption. Um, and um, so, you know, I think that um, investors are going to look at emerging markets when they can get a higher return, but um, they're going to look at ways to try to mitigate those risks. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there are a number of ways to do that. Uh, probably the most important is is making sure to do your due diligence and, and really um, dig deep. I mean, don't just, you know, do your desktop due diligence where, um, uh, you know, you're just looking at what's in the data room, um, but you need to get on the ground. You need to talk to the people. You need to understand the culture. Um, uh, and I don't just mean the, the, the culture of, of, the, of the country, but the, con country, the culture of, of, of the company, the culture of the people, uh, what they're like, uh, can you work with them? Um, you know, other issues are, are structuring. Um, you know, make sure, and, and not just in terms of legal structuring, that's very, very important, of course, um, but making sure you have a good partner. That's part of the structure too, someone you can rely on because in any jurisdiction, any foreign jurisdiction, uh, whether a developed market or an emerging market, um, if you don't have someone you're working with on the ground that you can rely on, you're going to be very lost. Um, and I think also the important thing is uh, integration. And that's, again, that's not anything special uh, for an emerging market, um, that's in, in any acquisition. It's it's trying, and that can even be in the same jurisdiction. Uh, it's trying to make those corporate cultures uh, merge, and and most acquisitions fail because of they fail to properly uh, integrate. 
Um, so, you know, those are some of the major risks. Um, and, uh, you know, those are sort of the, the high level issues that you would look at to try to mitigate those risks. And, you know, I'd be happy to talk further about uh, the details of, uh, of some of that uh, as we go on. Absolutely, and looking to looking forward to diving deeper into these issues, uh, Jad. I, before actually we move on to those those points, I, I wanted to actually understand a little bit more about Brookfield's story and what led you guys to to enter to the, in the MENA region. I mean, it's you know every few months we're seeing another headline about Brookfield doing major deals in the region. Uh, whereas, you know, going back not even that many years, most of the M&A activity that you saw in this region was mostly with, with regional players. Um, so does would your entry in the region, is that something that's idiosyncratic or is this a, are there factors that are bringing other large players in the region? Is this a, a, an example of a larger trend that's happening? Because again, we've seen uh, you know firms like KKR, BlackRock, Blackstone, uh, more multinationals bidding for assets in this region. Well, thank you, um, Zach, and thank you for having me. Um, look, we've actually, Brookfield's been present in the Middle East um, since 1997, primarily through our contracting business, Multiplex. Um, which has been instrumental in um, in a lot of the um, construction and 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 growth um, that we saw in the UAE um, since then. <clears throat> and so through them, we got to learn quite a bit about um, the UAE market in particular, um, and get a, a, a an extreme amount of comfort uh, in operating here, which eventually led to the establishment of an investment business um, over time. And so since then. Um, you know, over the past uh, three to five years, we've we've established a a a, a high powered investment practice here in the region, uh, based out of Dubai, um, and we currently have about three billion dollars um, under management. And just overall, um, we've always felt that, uh, and I'll speak to the UAE in, in particular, or the region is, um, we've always felt that it's uh, been a very uh, stable and attractive market uh, where we can uh, find uh, opportunities for outsized returns. Um, and so as a result of that, um, our presence here um, is, uh, is to continue to explore such opportunities. Uh, and I'm sure like-minded investors, such as the ones you, you mentioned, are, are also um, keen to explore those. So, Bill, you, you touched upon as one of the key words when you're looking at emerging markets and doing deals. And again, something that's increasingly on the agenda of investors, uh, even globally, and that is governance. Um, you, you, this is an issue that's often highlighted as, as a central theme, uh, particularly in one of the key challenges in emerging and frontier markets where governance may be an issue. Uh, how do you ensure that you're dealing, doing a deal with the right governance? And in what ways has COVID-19 actually changed the overall due diligence process, particularly in the assessment of good governance? Yeah, well, um, you know, in, in terms of trying to ensure you have good governance, back to what I said earlier, it, it is a question of, of doing the diligence. And, and again, you can't just do it in a superficial way. You can't just... You can't just look at a policy and say, oh, great, they've got, you know, such and such policy uh, uh, um, uh, in place. So it must all be it must all be fine because because policies are, are worthless if they're not backed up by action. Um, uh, I'll give you an example. I mean, I've, I've worked in, in emerging markets for for over 15 years now um, I've, both here and, and in uh, Russia and, and um, uh, in, in, in Eastern Europe. Um, and, um, you know, you see all sorts of crazy things. Um, and, and as an example, I've seen um, uh, countries, you know, worked on deals in countries where there's a high risk of corruption. And so as a, as a purchaser, you'll go in and you'll, you'll look at their policies. Oh, okay, great. They've got an anti-corruption policy in, in place. So everything must be, must be good. And then when you dig deep, you find out, wait, they're actually paying bribes left, right, and center. And you go and you talk to the manager and say, well, how in the world is it that you have this um, anti-bribery policy in place? Um, and yet you guys are bribing government officials. Um, they say, well, but of course, that's just the way we do business in our country. And, and so, you know, you can't just um, look at it superficially um, at, because sometimes it's window dressing. Um, you really have to dig deep. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it, it's doing diligence um, in a very hands-on manner um, and, and, and sometimes doing a bit more creative diligence. It's not just, you know, having the lawyers and the accountants in the, in the data room. 
Uh, it's getting people on the ground. And sometimes that's reputational due diligence, figuring out who your business partners are, you know, what are they like? Um, uh, you know, how are they known in the community? Are they respected? Um, uh, and, and, and you can't just get that uh, uh, through a data room. Um, I mean, in terms of the challenges and, and the changes since COVID, I'm not sure that much has changed. Obviously, you know, doing that on the ground diligence has been has been a big challenge, uh, and that continues to be, particularly, uh, sadly, in, in emerging markets where where vaccines are are, are still uh, difficult to find. Um, I think the other changes we've seen, um, you know, we've often seen we've seen several distressed acquisitions, um, um, uh, and so you'll often see diligence is done either based on, on limited um, uh, knowledge that's provided um, or on um, an accelerated timetable. Um, and when you get that, it's, it's even harder to accurately assess um, uh, the level of governance. Um, and I guess another thing that we've seen is um, a big change over the last year or two is um, uh, an emphasis on business continuity plans. Okay, everything's going fine, but then COVID or something else hits, you know, how do you guys pivot? Um, and that's something that I don't think people considered quite as much as they used to. Um, so I think that's what you know we've sort of seen from a, a governance perspective. Well, and Bill, one of the things that you importantly said at the beginning of the discussion is, you know, with all these additional risks, um, what investors are ultimately looking for if they're coming to emerging markets is that additional return, right? Uh, that return needs to be there. And uh, this is a question I wanted to bring back to, to you, Jad. With the divergence of expected yield and risk premia across uh, economies, you know, with high high credit ratings, along with overall lack of attractive yield in the West, uh, this seems to be precipitating a search for yield and returns in emerging markets. Uh, to what extent have these factors acted as a springboard for geographical diversification and global M and A? Well, I think quite a bit. Um, I think what we've um, what we've noticed um, historically is um, investors in, would look at a certain credit rating in one part of the world and, and the same credit rating in another part of the world very differently. Um, and I think uh, what happened as a result of that is you'd see a divergence in yields and spreads um, and expected returns. Um, <clears throat> and and that's driven a lot of um, investment towards, um, those markets in which you would have um, similar credit ratings, um, but a higher return. Um, now, what's what we've seen or what we continue to see over the past year really is um, more of a convergence of those yields and, and, and spreads, um, not to the same, not to the equivalent level, um, but a, a tightening of that um, difference uh, between the two, which just means that the market is becoming more efficient. Um, and more informed as it relates to that. Well, and that also means that people who have acquired assets in those markets are seeing those assets being priced upwards. Um, so, you know, I guess in that regard, being in emerging markets has been a, an effective strategy, particularly if you have uh, uh, pr principally dollar-based businesses uh, and don't have that FX risk. Um, how how much is, is is now talking about that? I mean, we talked about yields, but let's let's talk a bit about FX. Is is the preference still very much for dollar based deals, or is the recent softening of the dollar made uh, made there an additional potential appetite for taking that local currency risk? Well, I think in in terms of um, as you know, we we invest from multiple strategies, um, uh, predominantly dollar based, but there are there are some other currencies that that um, that we have had funds um, evaluate um, or, or invest in. Um, the, um, <clears throat> the the reality is, um, you know, at least from in, in the geography that I sit in, um, FX risk is is not our is, is not the biggest risk. Um, basically, if you look at the GCC, a lot of the currencies are pegged um, to the dollar. Uh, which takes out a lot of that uh, risk, which you allude to. Um, I think in, in, in certain geographies, um, of course, you will you will have to take uh, an FX risk, but there are ways to mitigate that as well through financial structuring. Um, if you have a, a, a very good idea of the time period in which you're going to be invested in. You know, the large majority of deals that we see are either 
um, dollar or or GCC currency based, and so effectively dollar based. Um, you know, people have been talking about the down the downfall of the dollar for an awfully long time now, and uh, I, I still don't see it happening uh, imminently. Well, so we talked about structuring around those risks and, and going back to some of the, the legal uh, aspects, um, uh, Bill, do, do you mind sharing some information about how people deal with legal framework gaps in emerging markets, and particularly when dealing with enforcement of rights? Are there any structural alternatives to deal with these issues and, and risks? Uh, are these risks that investors have to typically bear? Well, I mean, you can never eliminate all the risks, of course, um, but um, there are certain risks um, that are elevated um, in emerging markets. Uh, again, every market is different, so you can't make blanket statements, but but overall, um, I think you will see one of a number of, of factors um, in various emerging markets, you know, whether that's sort of you know, the reliability and, and impartiality of, of courts and government officials or or the sophistication of, of, uh, of, of the actors you're dealing with and issues of transparency. Um, and so there's, there's really no one option to, to structure around those. There, there are lots of options um, um, and you have to find the one that, that, that fits the deal, um, that fits um, the market um, uh, and, and that fits the parties in terms of their comfort. Um, so, I mean, you know, just a few ideas. I mean, obviously, the, the, the easiest thing to do w would be to just move the business to, to a diff different jurisdiction if it's, if it's a business that is adept to that, you know, a service type uh, uh, um, or, or, you know, example, a software business or something like that. that that's an option. That's usually not a viable option for, for most businesses. Um, and so, um, you know, the things you look at, at least from a legal perspective, uh, first and foremost, you know, make sure that you have strong contractual protections. Um, um, and in fact, you know, I, I see in, in the Q&A uh, that, that someone asked a, a very relevant question in, in that regard. So I hope you don't mind me jumping to this, but it's relevant for this point. Um, you know, this person asked, um, you know, what percentage of deal value is not paid until all the reps and warranties are, are addressed to ensure, you know, and then it's a great question. And, 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 and the answer is, you know, well, if, if you're the seller, um, uh, you know, none of it's held back. And if you're the buyer, well, as much as you can. And, and, and. And, and that's your best protection in a lot of ways is to is to hold back some of that money to protect the, against that risk. But that's usually hard to to accomplish. You have to have pretty good leverage to be able to do that. Um, so you know that's a kind of contractual protection that's that's very very effective. Um, um, but you know that's only one option to look at. I mean I think another very common thing you, you know you have to look at um, you know well not even a common thing. This is an essential thing I should say you need to think about, you know, how successfully you can enforce your rights um, in the jurisdiction you're operating in. Um, and if that's a problem, um, you need to think about, well, where else can we enforce those rights? And so uh, that goes back to the structuring question of, of, you know, I've seen a lot of deals that are structured um, uh, in, in other jurisdictions. You'll, you'll have the the, 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 the actual purchase, you know, you'll set up an SPV uh, in an offshore jurisdiction. Um, uh, and that sort of um, helps to provide some protection uh, to the buyer, um, uh, especially if you can enforce um, against assets uh, that are outside of the jurisdiction where you're operating. Um, and, and, you know, that's essential too, is making, you know, if, if your assets and all of your potential recourse um, are only in a jurisdiction where you're not comfortable in terms of your ability to enforce, then then that's a problem. And so you want to make sure that you've got some kind of recourse, and this could be financial guarantees, um, uh, uh, it can be personal guarantees against against assets that are located outside of the country. Um, um, you know that's very important to mitigate those risks. But but tied to that is something that's very very important, um, and, and a lot of people I think fail to take into consideration is just how tough it is to actually um, enforce a contract. Um, if you're in a situation where you're actually going to bring a, a claim for a breach of a warranty uh, and you're gonna go to arbitration and the other side says, no, we disagree, you know, that is a very, very long and usually expensive process. Um, and, and that's just to get the, the, the judgment. It can take, it can take years. Um, it can cost millions of dollars, quite frankly. Um, and, and then you might not even be able to enforce it. 
Um, and because because you may get the judgment and you spend all that time and money, you may spend just as much trying to enforce it. Um, and so really, you know, before you even start with the diligence, before you start looking at the specifics of the company, you need to think, okay, if it all goes wrong, um, are we going to be able to recover some of our losses? Um, so those are some of the sort of basic, you know, legal 101 issues uh, you would look at in terms of trying to mitigate those risks. And just quickly going back to the to the reps and warranties, we've been seeing an intri- increased interest in reps and warranty insurance coverage. Um, but then by the time you get the pricing, uh, usually that interest kind of fizzles out. Um, and what are, are you seeing a lot of deals where you have uh, coverage from a major insurer for, for reps and warranties? Or are you, you typically seeing that that gets kind of priced out of the market? It sounds great in theory, but in practice, there are too many exclusions for it to even work. Um, it's, it's not as common um, here as it is in, say, the U.S. and Europe, where it is fairly common. It's, it's actually, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense, um, the, the concept, um, because th- there's so much risk involved in, in the warranties for, for both parties. Um, and if you can offload that risk, even if it comes at a cost, it's just, it's just like, you know, insuring your house. Um, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's a cost and it's not an insignificant cost, but if you lose your house, you're in a lot of trouble. Um, um, and it's really, you know, the chances of that happening are, are pretty low, but if it does happen, it, it's a major problem. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, reps and warranty insurance is something that, that has been used quite a bit in, in the West. I have seen parties try to bring it to developed markets, mostly insurers, of course, because they want the business. Um, and I've seen it used some, but pretty rarely. And I think part of that Part of that is because of the pricing, but part of that pricing is based on the fact that you're working in, in emerging markets where uh, the risk is a bit higher and, and a bit harder to predict. And so they certainly price that into their models. But I, th- but I, think, I think we'll probably see more of it um, uh, in the years to come. I think as, as the insurers are able to better predict and, and price that into their models, um, and as markets get more sophisticated, we'll probably see more and more of that. One of the things that we've seen, particularly in the last year, has been the phenomenon of decreasing deal volume, but that being coupled with an increasing deal magnitude. Uh, Is this indicative of a persistent trend towards bigger ticket deals going forward? Or do you think that unique market conditions precipitated this divergence, the massive injection of of liquidity coming from central banks, mostly finding its way into highly institutional uh, hands um, and not triggering as much of an effect for, for smaller players? Uh, or is this part of a bigger trend? Uh, Jad, I'd love to understand, I mean, being, you know, one of the kind of juggernauts of the industry, uh, whether you see this as a trend or as, as something that, uh, that is more idiosyncratic. I think it, it, it will be a trend, um, but there, there's, there's nothing sinister about it. What, what I'd say, though, is you, you've got a lot of um, dry powder. I mean, first off, you have a lot of consolidation amongst let's say, um, institutional investors um, in, and I'm speaking strictly about the alternative um, investment management space, Um, more and more you're starting to find um, alternative investment managers raising larger and larger funds, um, which is uh, accounting for a larger and larger part of the investment going into that space. Uh, which results in a couple of things. Number one is um, the, the the need to deploy capital, i.e., dry powder, um, which uh, which will um, always uh, you know result in larger transactions. Um, and uh, and so as a result of that, um, there probably uh, is a trend away from I'd say smaller type uh, investment managers, um, at least as it relates to the industries we're active in. Um, of course, there are exceptions. I mean, if you look at the venture capital space, um, you know, that's, that's very liquid, that's very fluid, um, and that'll continue to, uh, to, to remain. Um, but uh, I don't expect uh, in the overall to see much of a difference to what we're seeing, uh, to what we're seeing currently. Um, but deal volumes, uh, it, it's a bit difficult to 
analyze them on their own, because even if you look at the last, um, you know, since the beginning of 2020 and since we've gone through a pandemic, um, deal volumes uh, would have naturally decreased. Um, and, uh, and, and notwithstanding that, even if we looked at personal consumption, uh, I'm sure if we look at the stats there, personal consumption would have decreased as well. So, um, you know, it's probably a mixture of many, many factors. So, yeah, in 2020, we certainly saw a decrease, uh, particularly in emerging markets. Overall, a number of deals decreased by about 20 percent year over year. Uh, have you seen a pickup in deal flow thus far this year going into to 2021? Um, and which economies do you do you see or which sectors do you see as the outperformers and laggards uh, going into this uh, this period of the cycle? Uh, yeah, I would, yeah, I would, I would say, um, I would say, absolutely, we're seeing increased activity. Though, um, you know, surprisingly, activity never stopped. Um, you know, we still transacted in in 2020, uh, and and not just in this market, but globally. Um, so, you know, the the the, the industry is resilient uh, in, in in that way. Um, but the um, <clears throat> but yes, I, I think we will see. Um, increased activity. I mean, we've already seen, um, you know, a lot of activity. If, if we look in, in this region in Saudi Arabia, um, you know, Aramco just got a big, um, a big infrastructure transaction closed. Um, and uh, at least from from where we sit, uh, we see the GCC as a very interesting market um, over the next few years, just given how they've handled the pandemic um, and uh, and the benefits that they'll reap as a result of that. Uh in 2021, in the first quarter, we saw uh, the four largest M&A deals that, that happened in the MENA region were in mining and oil and gas. Uh, now, Bill, I know that uh, you've been following the trend of the shift to, to ESG, and globally there's been an intensified focus on ESG factors uh, and, and how they factor into not only M&A activity, but uh, valuations. Um, and which assets are, are, are attractive and which assets are, uh, are, are, are not uh, as, as attractive for, for buyers. Has, has this mindset started to take place in the Middle East or has, is the region's focus, uh, you know, it's, it's natural kind of uh, focus on uh, oil and gas, uh, meaning that it's uh, not uh, going the, with the trend of the rest of the world towards this ESG, particularly focusing on the E factor? Um, no, I mean, it's it's definitely becoming a very, very important factor. Um, and, and that's because investors demand it. Um, um, you know, they're, they're, they're shareholding the institutional investors, their shareholders demand it. Um, and so th that's the mandate now. Um, and uh, if you're looking to to raise capital, um, you have to respond to, to what the people with the money are, are, are telling you to do. Um, and so I, there's been a huge movement towards that all over the region. And even from an environmental perspective, I, you know, I, I think that's more personally, this is just my personally, I think that's more driven by, by the, the current trends in, in the move towards renewables and, and a company like uh, Aramco, which is, which is trying to reshape itself from, from what I've seen into, you know, a, 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 an alternative energy uh, provider as well. Um, uh, you know, they just realize in order to survive, they're going to have to make that that move. Or I mean, you know, I mean, I, and globally, I mean, look at just what what just happened at uh, at Exxon um, in terms of uh, you know uh, uh, having these um, uh, board members um, um, elected who are going to uh, push uh, for uh, more carbon neutral forms of energy. So you're seeing it everywhere. You're seeing it in, in oil and gas, uh, um, uh, uh, but in other industries too, certainly. Um, uh, and you're certainly seeing it in this part of the region. Um, and I think the UAE, as it often does in the region, um, is taking the lead. Um, uh, you know, we now have uh, uh, mandates for, for women on, on boards and public companies. Um, uh, we have uh, corporate governance guidelines for, for listed companies. Um, and, uh, you know, you have all sorts of sustainability initiatives um, by, by government agencies. Um, uh, here in Dubai, uh, the, the, the Dubai financial market um, introduced um, an ESG reporting guide and an ESG index, uh, which which tracks uh, how the, the listed companies are, are responding in terms of, of ESG. So yeah, I mean it's 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 really everywhere. And I mean I know that um, you know most of our clients and if not all of our clients are very very focused on on ESG. 
um, and, and they're trying to implement policies and, and, and practices to, to support that. Um, and so, yeah, when we're doing deals, I mean, ESG is now a part of, of what we look into and we're doing due diligence um, on, on a company to, to see whether they're keeping up with, with not only just the latest regulations, but, but also the, the, just the trends um, um, and, and whether that, um, uh, you know, whether they're actually putting their money where their mouth is and not just having, having a policy, but, but implementing it. Cause, cause I mean, it's, it's, it's actually in some ways worse to, um, uh, to have a policy and not implement it, than just not have it at all because it just, it, it makes you look hypocritical and that can cause reputational risks. Um, so, you know, going back to what I said earlier, it, it's not just about, you know, uh, having the lawyers, you know, put together a nice piece of paper for you. Um, it, it's then, you know, making sure that gets implemented throughout the organization. Um, and, and actually becomes a, a living document. So, uh, Jad, actually, we were just talking before this call about uh, Mark Carney, who's joined Brookfield uh, fairly recently as your vice chair and the head of ESG and Impact Fund Investing. Uh, so clearly, this has been a, a big focus for uh, Brookfield. I understand that you have uh, s several funds that are that are focusing on these assets. How has this ESG dynamic not only affected your asset allocation, your proactive allocation, but actually, is it also driving some divestitures? So we uh, we do take it very seriously. We now have a vertical that is completely focused on on ESG. Um, we've been investing in renewables for a very long time, um, and, and so um, you know that is a natural progression for us. We are one of the world's largest ESG investors, and, and you did mention that uh, you know we've been fortunate to have the uh, former Bank of England Governor Mark Kearney join us, and he is leading um, our ESG practice, in which we are starting um, a fund to invest from. Um, so that is a that is a global um, a global strategy for us that uh, I think will become more pertinent um, and and more popular over time. Um, and what's interesting about it, quite frankly, is the way we're looking at it is not just what is ESG today, but it is what can we invest in today that can become ESG or ESG friendly. Um, so a lot of the investments we're evaluating today, if they don't quite fit the ESG framework, we always keep a hat on that evaluates whether they, we can make them um, uh, you know, more eco-friendly uh, or sustainable. And, um, and so it is a driver. It's something that's on our mind uh, consistently. You mentioned that this is something that's that's on your mind consistently, and and I'd love to understand. Yeah, it's it's certainly on the the proactive front. I mean, do you have also? I mean, do you have some legacy assets that are maybe not ESG friendly that you've been getting rid of as well? Has that been you know driving the the sell side, or is it just really on the buy side that it's, that that ESG is having a having a, a clear focus? Well, I would say we've always had it in mind. Um, so it's it's not as much about what is in the portfolio today as much as how are we structuring the portfolio going forward. So I'd say it's it's certainly um, a lot on our mind about how we construct our portfolio management going forward, or how we how we allocate um, investments going forward, rather than uh, what have we done historically. Um, there's a question from the audience uh, regarding the inflationary pressure that's building up through uh, rising commodity prices and whether this is also having a, an impact on, on M&A, on sectors that are of focus. Is this making commodity related deals more interesting? Uh, how is this impacting uh, the view on, on emerging markets? Um, and uh, potentially sector-related deals. If, if Bill, you were nodding. If you wouldn't mind, you know, giving your views on that. Yeah, and I mean, I, I was nodding mostly because I think it's a great question. Um, I, I certainly don't really have a view on that um, because I haven't seen an effect yet. I mean, I think I think those inflationary pressures are still, um, you know, somewhat new. It's really been over the, only the last few months and. I haven't seen that trickle into deal flow, and I expect it'll it'll take a little bit of time. Um, uh, hopefully, you know it, it will come under control. Hopefully, it was you know um, a, a question of of just everything being sort of backed up because of COVID, and now that markets are opening up again, uh, 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 things will will settle a bit. Um, but um, uh, you know it's 
it, it certainly could be extremely disruptive um, to, to, to valuations and, and, and you know, um, uh, it's interesting. We, we, look at, we look at events like COVID and see the, the havoc that it, 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 it wreaks, um, but simple things like, you know, inflation can, can wreak tremendous havoc as well. Um, and um, so it's a great question, but, but I, I don't think anyone really has the answer for that quite yet. Yeah, I, again, I would echo the, the fact that, sorry, J I'll, Jad, it looks like you were going to jump in there, so I'll let you go with that. I was. Um, I was I was just going to add that, um, you know, it really depends on the strategy of, of each investor. Um, people will look at it differently. Some people are comfortable taking commodity uh, risk or, or commodity inflation risk. Some people aren't. Um, you know, and, and, and the transactions that we've done, we've, we've tended to, uh, to shy away from um, commodity price risk. Um, but, you know, everyone has a flavor. Every, every investor has a strategy. Um, and, and so some people may be, may be playing on, on, on those inflationary, uh, let's say, expectations. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, 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 it's a good pertinent question, but it's very broad and every investor might have a different answer to that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, again, in these, the, the reflection of, of inflation in markets is, is a relatively new phenomenon. But I, I can speak to the fact that, the, I mean, the typical way that you would play this through, through an M&A strategy is to, to buy commodity producers. But with the backdrop of ESG, um, that has become a much less attractive space. Now, one thing that we're seeing, and, and we're, we're seeing a lot of, of deals and funds that are raising uh, capital to do deals, and an important uh, space of, of focus is actually more ESG-friendly uh, commodity producers and, and, and mining deals. Because at the end of the day, you know, people think of those as, as a contradiction of terms. How can you be ESG friendly and be a, a company that's extracting, uh, extracting commodities? Well, let everybody remember this energy transition relies on metals. It relies on rare earths and it relies on a lot of things that we're not producing enough of. So if you look at the commodities that have really been on fire, those are the ones that are going into batteries. Those are the ones that are going into electric cars. Um, you know, we, we've seen, uh, you know, shortages of, of these commodities. And there's even talk about a, a decoupling in the pricing of some of these commodities. Uh, again, you think of, of, you know, copper as, as you know, something that's it's perfect, um, that has a high degree of fungibility um, from, from one market to another, but actually in buyers are really starting to differentiate between the kind of provenance of those those assets and where they're coming from. So I think that this is going to have an impact on emerging markets. I think this is going to have an impact on, uh, you know, the, the types of deals that we see that we're going to see an increasing interest in, you know, clean commodities and a decreasing interest in kind of these these dirty commodities um, taking as a way of taking advantage of this inflationary cycle. But it is it is too early to see that we've seen. Uh, but we have seen, you know, uh, a few funds that are focusing on that space that have done phenomenally well um, and seem to be taking advantage of a bigger trend. One of the other trends that we're, we've seen, um, particularly over the last year and, and Jad, I'd love to to hear your your, your view on this. Are are the the, uh, uh, the the boom in the SPAC market? So SPACs are obviously fulfilling a unique role in M and A and capital markets, and kind of sitting in between. Um, despite this being predominantly a U.S. phenomenon, do you see SPACs as uh, potential? increasingly potential bidders in in emerging markets do you see them do you think that this is part of you know are they are they here to stay are you going to you know continue to see these guys uh bidding for deals um and you know do you have any context or examples of of spac spacs happening in emerging markets i know jad that you had uh you actually had a quite interesting anecdote on this so yeah i mean look i'd say that um spacs uh do you know, they do provide a, an, an ability for, um, for you know, the average investor to invest and take part in some very interesting um, acquisition um, or investment strategies. Um, I think whether they're, they're here to stay or not um, is probably more, um, more dependent on, on each SPAC and how it, how it performs. I mean, it's no different than uh, an investor evaluating a fund 
um, in which they're putting, um, you know, their money into and, 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 and relying on that manager to, to invest it uh, appropriately. So, you know, is there a difference between what we'll see in the emerging markets and the U.S.? Uh, you know, I think we'll continue to see it be a predominant U.S. phenomenon, um, but I would expect that people um, globally will, um, you know, will continue to, uh, to evaluate these as, uh, as not just um, investment vehicles, but potentially exit vehicles. Um, and um, and look, I think you know we've we've seen um, you know SPACs uh, pop up in, in different shapes and forms uh, forms throughout, um, and uh, and I'm sure the Middle East will be uh, will be no uh, no exception to that. Um, and so um, you know how and what shape those take um, TBD, um, but we'll uh, you know it's something that that we look at very closely. Is do you see any key differences between SPACs? Uh, in, in the United States and SPACs that are dealing in emerging markets? Um, are, are there any key differences in you know, the, the risks, the, the sponsor profile, the deal sizes? Yeah, look, I, I think one, um, one key difference will, will be that you know, people investing, the investors, I mean, you know, we need to differentiate between who's the investor here because SPACs are also investors, but you know, the investors in SPACs um, will probably want to feel very comfortable with the, you know, the team um, of the SPAC and the markets in which they're investing in. Um, and in developed markets, um, that's probably easier. Um, in growth markets, you might not find that deep of a bench um, of people to back. Um, and, and so that's probably going to be the biggest differentiator um, between, uh, I'll say, between the two separate, um, let's say, uh, strategies. Um, but, the, uh, but overall, I'd say also, um, you know, for people investing in growth markets, um, you know, they need to ensure that the SPACs um, that they are investing in um, are, uh, are, are able to assess the, the risks, I think, that Bill uh, very eloquently, uh, you know, relayed, um, but also um, are in compliance with some of the standards that these investors would get um, in, um, in, in U.S. SPACs. So, Bill, actually, earlier in our discussion, we were talking about uh, we were talking about control. We were talking about enforcement of rights. And actually, one of the kind of presumptions on this entire discussion was that we were talking about uh, you know control, majority uh, uh, transactions. But um, a lot of EM emerging, and this is a question from from Naush, Naush Malek in the audience. Uh, EM private investment was historically looking at growth capital, minority stakes. Has there been a general shift towards uh, majority and control transactions? Um, is this a result of these markets becoming more mature uh, or possibly of previous strategies not kind of fulfilling the dreams uh, or expectations that they might have for minority stake uh, deals? Um, it's a tough question for me to answer on a, on a macro level, just because I'm, I'm not an analyst and I can only sort of speak from, from my anecdotal experience. Um, you know, I, I think in large part, that's, that's going to be something that's, that's dealt with investor by investor. I, I think from a, you know, I, I do, I do a, a fairly decent amount of, of private equity work, uh, not exclusively, but, but, you know, um, work with, uh, whether it's uh, portfolio companies that that are seeking investment or or for funds themselves, um, you know, so, some funds will only invest on a minority basis, others only on a majority basis. I personally have probably seen a bit more of a trend um, towards um, uh, funds that will will take a minor a majority interest. Um, but again, that that could just be anecdotally what I'm seeing. Um, uh, most of the work that I do. Um, does involve taking a, a majority interest, um, but again, it's it, 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 I, it's still sort of all over the place. I, I don't know that I would say that I've seen a a, a major trend uh, one way or another. I mean, I mean, Jad, you know, may be able to respond better just because he is working for a, a big institution that, that probably monitors these things more closely. So, so look, I would I would say that. Um... Well, the beauty of, 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 of an institution such as Brookfield is, is we're so large that we have multiple investment strategies. So, you know, it's, it's sort of, we, we evaluate everything. Um, but what I would say is um, what we, I wouldn't be so focused on control versus growth versus, you know, these are all just, you know, they're terminologies at the end of the day. What, what, what I think investors really want is influence. 
And there are many ways to get that influence. And, um, you know, notwithstanding that in a control um, investment, you are, uh, you know, by far the influencer um, uh, driving that. But, you know, we've also been in situations where we're not um, the majority control, but yet we, we, we still have the influence that we require in order to ensure um, that, um, that, you know, we're, we're in, a, in a good spot and we've made the right choice in terms of structure. Um, one thing that I think all investors will always want a certain amount of influence upon is their exit. Um, and how are they going to monetize the investment? Uh, and, and I think you'll find how much investors require will differ on, on the appetite. Um, but uh, even from the global institutional investors, um, our peers that we've seen as, as well as ourselves come in, it's been a mixed, uh, a mixed bag in terms of control versus, uh, versus uh, minority, but with influence. And how do you maintain influence? Maybe this is a, a question that that, that uh, Bill can add to as well. Uh, over exit, um, when you're a minority stake, what are some of the the key rights that you would uh, see in in a in a shareholders agreement, or where where would you find some of these rights to ensure that uh, that you have that influence necessary? Yeah, you you want to make sure that you document the shareholders agreement uh, properly. Um, that um, you know you have whether it's tag along rights or, or 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 you know rights in terms of of uh, you know input on on valuation issues uh, etc. Um, uh, but I think uh, you, you know th those are sort of mechanical and 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 those you you negotiate and you either get them or you don't. Um, I think after that you know your influence is is really you know a, a question more of of the of the soft skills in some ways and that's just staying engaged and, and playing an active role um and and some investors want to do that and some investors are very good at that and 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 some just want to sit back and 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 just let their money ride um and um you know and and some you know companies who are seeking investment you know they feel the same way sometimes they want a, an active investor especially if they're contributing um, um and, and helping them i mean you know most most private equity investments um uh, and even more so with venture capital you're contributing not just money you're hopefully contributing uh, expertise um, um and 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 you're you know you're you're contributing something that will will make the company more valuable not not just through the financial investment and and that's great for for a good investor um it's it can be absolute hell for a company if if the the investor is um you know not really productive or 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 you know is is, is too in, involved and too active um, um, or, 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 or takes the company in a direction um, that, that perhaps the, the founders don't want. And, and, and so there's that balance of control again. And, and obviously the, the, the founders will want to maintain control so they, they can um, uh, uh, you know, keep things going the way they envision it. And, and it's, you know, it, it's a dance in terms of the negotiations, but, but it's obviously crucial that you, you strike that balance properly when you're doing those negotiations and you, and you sign that shareholders agreement, but but there's a lot that can be done afterwards um, in terms of influence as well. Zach, I, I'll maybe just jump in there. And I, I think what, what Bill alluded to in terms of soft uh, power, soft influence is, um, is, is very key um, uh, if you are not in a uh, majority position. Um, and, and what we've, uh, at least what I've seen is um, transparency and honesty from the get-go is the best policy in, in terms of being open and honest with any potential partners that you might have about your intentions, um, about your, um, you know, your view of uh, the investment period, um, you know, how you believe you might be able to add value, um, because these are all considerations. Um, and at the end of the day, um, again, if you're not a control investor and you're in a, a more, let's say, partnership type uh, of, of investment, um, it's it's a partnership for a very long time, and um, and if you haven't been um, upfront or transparent from the get go, um, things can can unfortunately not end up the way you want it to. Will. Uh, another question I wanted to to discuss is is around some of the key differences in how the sell side process is run in emerging markets, and particularly in the in the Middle East. Um, uh, I'd love to understand if you're seeing, you know, 
uh, key differences in the way deals are marketed. Uh, fewer kind of broad auctions, more limited auctions or target solicitations. Um, you know, Jad, you're, you're nodding. So, so yeah, I mean, is that, you know, can you, can you speak to how the process may be different? What are some of the key reasons that those processes are different in emerging markets and particularly in MENA? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's changed quite a bit um, over time. I, I think um, first and foremost, we've, we've seen the, the sophistication level, um, not just of the process, but of the sellers. Um, change quite substantially over the past decade. Um, and that has assisted, um, you know, a lot of these, um, you know, big headline, you know, sell sides uh, in, in getting executed. Um, you know, people are, are, are a lot more open um, in, in terms of the different types of structures that they're willing to entertain. Um, and also, um, we've seen that the profile of the investors um, looking at least at this region um, has only expanded tremendously over time. Um, and whereas, you know, maybe a decade ago, you were looking at a more regional investment type profile, uh, regional type investor profile. Um, today, I mean, notwithstanding, um, you know, Brookfield being a global investor, um, you know, we do see many of our peers um, pop up on, on transactions that we are, um, that we are evaluating. Um, I continue to believe that having a presence here on the ground, um, you know, of an investment team, or an investments team helps us and gives us a, a, a you know an edge because at the end of the day um, you know it's all about building relationships. Um, so um, so you know we I do expect that um, we'll start to see more and more of those global um, investors starting to to enter the market and we've seen it quite substantially over the past three years alone. And and do you see them so with with a more global investor with a more sophisticated investor with a more sophisticated seller would you say that you know, auctions are, are auction processes are becoming more common, whereas historically it was just bilateral, um, you know, or just very limited target solicitations. Uh, but are, are those auctions still staying relatively limited or are they very broad open auctions like you'd see in the U.S.? It depends on the deal size and it depends on um, when we're talking about. I, I think what we've seen is in the, in the very big ticket space, um, which is a space that we're frequently involved in. Um, it has been not bilateral per se, it depends. We have done bilateral deals, but we've also participated in limited auctions. Um, the, the reason being that the ticket size itself determines who might want or who may be in the process. Um, and so going out to a wide range of people doesn't necessarily improve um, the probability of getting a deal done. Um, when actually, in many times, it, it might actually limit um, the ability. Um, and so, um, you know, we have seen certain processes that have gone out to very limited investors, and of which we would always be one. Um, and those have usually been the ones where we feel um, most comfortable transacting on. Yeah, and that's a trend that we've, we've seen as well. Um, you know, we're seeing auction processes becoming more common, but still very limited, you, you know, having to really do the work to qualify the to qualify the buyers, make sure that you're talking to the right buyers. Um, you know, obviously, you don't want to leave stones unturned. I mean, we advise uh, companies that are that are selling um, on 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 these processes. Uh, one thing that I'd, I'd like to 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 one frust key frustration though that uh, a lot of us see, and, and Bill, I'd, I'd love to hear your kind of input or thoughts on this is is um, helping the sellers of these companies understand that if they want to do an auction process, which is the best way to maximize value, that it actually means that a heck of a lot more work needs to be done at the beginning before before you even start talking to investors. And that means a lot of cost. Uh, that means you're going to be spending a lot of money on, you know, on legal and uh, potentially on vendor DD um, and on the types of things that, that prepare you for running an auction process so that your bidders uh, know exactly what they're bidding for. Uh, whereas, a, you know, targeted solicitation bilateral deal allows you to kind of do a lot of that as you go. So, Bill, is that something that you've also also seen is is that, you know, that increase uh, in auction processes also comes at a cost and some kind of resistance to, of companies to kind of foot that cost? Um, I mean, I think that's, I think that's a good point um, in the sense that indeed um, an auction is going to take a lot of work up front. Uh, now, hopefully 
Um, that pays off by having uh, a lot less work uh, further down the line. And, and particularly from a legal perspective, um, if, if, if you're the seller um, uh, and um, you, know, you have a, a, a highly desirable asset, you can say, you know what, here's our SPA and, and it's fair and you take it or leave it. We'll take a few comments here or there, um, but, but you know, don't come back with a, a massive red line because we're just not going to accept it. Um, and, and that can actually save a lot of time at the end of the day. So, so the overall cost, you know, might not be that different, and and you might indeed maximize your your valuation through an auction auction process. Uh, but you're absolutely right; it's more of an upfront um, uh, uh, cost for uh, when you're doing an auction. I mean, I, I I think that you know, it's not something we see a ton of, uh, not nearly as much as you would see, for example, in, in the US. And that is going back to what Jad said. I mean, it, it's really a question of valuations. Um, uh, you know, for most sellers, um, the, 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 for a lot of the deals here, they're, they're not massive tickets. Um, and so, you know, going to that cost question, they don't want to expend the, the, the resources um, uh, uh, up front. Um, uh, so you, you see them some, but, but not that much um, uh, compared to uh, just sort of the bilateral deals. Um, and and uh, there there has been a, a question from the, from the audience. I mean, we we alluded to this and the kind of yield uh, compression, spread compression that we're that we're seeing in the markets. The impact that that may have on valuations um, getting uh, you know a little bit frothier in this uh, in the emerging markets as they have in the the rest of the world. Um, but uh, the question from the audience is whether that may be whether there may be differences in specific sectors or geographies that are core competencies, particularly of, of yourselves. I mean, Jad, I'd love to, to see what you've seen over the last uh, you know a few years in terms of evaluation, where where it's become much more rich uh, from a sector geography perspective, and where it remains otherwise subdued. So uh, look, I'd, I'd say that the what what we've seen is um, there's a lot of interest in infrastructure in our in our region in in the Middle East, um, and uh, I can't comment on whether it's rich or it's not rich, um, but the there's certainly been a trend towards tighter spreads um, on um, you know on on these transactions and and even and and within a, a short amount of time now. We also need to keep in mind that the, the general interest rate environment as well as yield environment has been extremely low um, for a while now. Um, so it's kind of like, it's about time uh, that you know we, we see these spreads tightening over here. Um, but having said that, there still is value to be had. Um, I think if you, if, you, if you look at other sectors, um, they're probably not as bid for as what we've seen on, on the infrastructure side so far. And I, I mean, we're actually almost out of time. I, I would love to keep this discussion going for another hour or two, but uh, we, we are, do have a hard stop at, at five o'clock. Um, the the one, one question that, uh, that, that struck me, you know, we had a lot of conversation uh, on ESG. Um, is, there, is there any, you know, difference in how you source deal flow on ESG, uh, on ESG deals? And, and are there, you know, what are what are some of the particular sectors? What does this mean in practice? What are sectors that are tend to be more ESG friendly and uh, and less so, Jad, if you wouldn't mind? Well, I mean, we 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 source similar to how we would source any transaction, which is through our relationships, through being in the market, um, through uh, through ensuring we're plugged in, um, and uh, and and through our credentials. Quite frankly, I mean, you know, when we when we are partaking in an investment more times than not, um, the, the person on the other side uh, recognizes that, that Brookfield is, uh, is either a right partner or a right owner um, uh, of those assets. Um, I, you know, I think the, the, uh, as to you know, the specific yields within each subsector, um, you know, in, 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 the, in, in the region, you are seeing a lot of um, renewable uh, activity um, and the yields have, uh, have always been consistently competitive. Uh, on that, and we've seen of recent uh, district cooling, which is uh, which is a very active sector here, and and a sector which uh, which is very energy efficient um, in in terms of uh, uh, in terms of how it distributes um, the cooling. 
um, has has been a uh, has been a very popular play for for many investors. Um, and so uh, I'd consider uh, con I would expect that we continue to see those trends, at least in those subsectors of ESG, uh, continue to play out. Well, thank you both so much. We are out of time. Thank you to everyone in the audience who uh, took part in this session. I'm so sorry that we weren't able to get to, to more of your questions, but we'll, we'll definitely look to be doing another M&A-focused session on, uh, on the AIM Summit webinar series and at our in-person conference uh, that's going to be happening in Dubai. That's going to be on the 11th and 12th of October here in the DIFC. Registration is now live. Uh, remember, if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, please like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel, now um, everyone who's on the live session go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel so you at least get the uh, the uh, recordings of, of all of these sessions so you can watch them later uh, again thank you so much to to uh, to the the to, to Jad and to Bill and to Charles Russell speechless for making this session possible uh, really appreciate it and look forward to having you again